USS Californian was a Leyland Line steamship that is best known for the controversy surrounding her location during the sinking of the RMS Titanic on April 15, 1912. She was later sunk herself, on November 9, 1915, by a German submarine in the eastern Mediterranean during World War I. History Californian was a British steamship owned by the Leyland Line, part of J.P. Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company, and was constructed by the Caledon Shipbuilding and Engineering Company in Dundee, Scotland. She measured 6,223 tons, was 447 feet long, 53 feet at her beam, and had an average full speed of 12 knots. She had a triple expansion steam engine which was powered by two double dented boilers, and was primarily designed to transport cotton, but also had the capacity of carrying 47 passengers and 55 crew members. She was the largest ship built in Dundee up to that time but subsequently larger ships were constructed. Californian was launched on November 26, 1901 and completed her sea trials on January 23, 1902. From January 31, 1902 to March 3, 1902, she made her maiden voyage from Dundee to New Orleans, Louisiana in the United States. Equals sinking of Titanic equals. Stanley Lord, who had commanded Californian since 1911, was her captain when she left Liverpool, England on April 5, 1912 on her way to Boston, Massachusetts. She was not carrying any passengers on this voyage. On Sunday 14 April at 19 o'clock, Californian's only wireless operator, Cyril Evans, signaled to the Antillian that three large icebergs were five miles to the south. This put them 15 miles north of the course the White Star Line passenger ship Titanic was heading. Titanic's wireless operator Harold Bride also received the warning and delivered it to the ship's bridge at 22.20 that evening while in latitude 50 degrees 05 minutes north. At longitude 50 degrees 07 minutes west and steering a course of due west, a position to the south of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, Californian encountered a large ice field. Captain Lord spotted it just in time and ordered the helm hard right and the engines full astern. Her head swung rapidly to the right but it was too late. She actually entered the loose margins of the ice field. Lord decided to stop the ship and wait until morning to proceed further. Before going down from the bridge, he thought he saw a ship's light away to the eastward but could not be sure it was not just a rising star. He carried on down to the engineer's cabins and met with the chief whom he told about his plans for stopping. As they were talking, they saw a ship's lights approaching. Lord went to the wireless room to find out if Evans knew of any ships in the area. He met him on the way and informed him that he did. A Euro only the Titanic a Euro Lord instructed him to call and inform her that Californian was stopped and surrounded by ice. On deck, 3rd Officer C. V. Groves also saw the lights of another ship come into view on the horizon 3.5 points above Californian's starboard beam. He first saw it at 11.10 p.m. when 10 or 12 miles away. At the time Californian was heading northeast. It finally stopped 6 miles away at 11.40 p.m. To him, she was clearly a large liner, as she had multiple decks brightly lit. Fifteen minutes after spotting the vessel, Groves went below to inform Lord. The latter suggested that the ship be contacted by Morse lamp, which was tried, but no reply was seen. Titanic S on duty wireless operator, Jack Phillips, was busy working off a substantial backlog of personal messages with the wireless station at Cape Race, Newfoundland, 800 miles away at the time. When Evans sent the message that they were stopped and surrounded by ice, the relative proximity made Californian's signal loud in Phillips headphones. As Evans attempted to transmit his ice message, Phillips was unable to hear a separate, prior message he had been in the process of receiving from Cape Race, and he rebuked Evans with, Shut up, shut up. I am busy. I am working Cape Race. Evans listened for a little while longer and at 23.30 he turned off the wireless and went to bed. Ten minutes later, Titanic hit an iceberg. Ten minutes after that, her lookout, Frederick Fleet, spotted a nearby ship. She sent out her first distress call 25 minutes later. Slightly after midnight 2nd officer Herbert Stone took watch from Groves. 
He too, tried signaling the ship with the Morse lamp, also without success. Around 0045 on April 15, he saw a white flash appear from the direction of the nearby ship. First he thought it was a shooting star, until he saw another one. He saw five rockets before being joined by the apprentice. He called down the speaking tube to Captain Lord at 1.15, but it is unclear how many rockets he told him about. Lord asked if there had been a company signal. Stone said he did a Euro unregistered trademark T no. Lord told Stone to tell him if anything about the ship changed, to keep signaling it with the Morse lamp, but did not request that it be contacted by wireless. Regulations of the time specified rockets firing at one minute intervals would signal distress. As fired from Titanic, at irregular and longer term intervals, there may have been considerable doubt as to their meaning. At the British inquiry following the Titanic disaster, Stone and apprentice officer James Gibson admitted to snippets of the conversation that they had had during their watch that night. The ship is not going to fire rockets at sea for nothing, Stone said, and also, have a look at her now. She looks very queer out of the water a euro her lights look queer. Gibson observed, she looks rather to have a big side out of the water, and he agreed that everything was not all right with her. That it was a case of some kind of distress. By 2.00 the ship appeared to be leaving the area. A few minutes later Gibson informed Captain Lord as suching that eight white rockets had been seen. Lord, who said that he had been asleep, asked whether they were sure of the color. Gibson said yes and left. At 2.20. Titanic sank. Around 3.30 Stone and Gibson, still sharing the middle watch, spotted rockets to the south. They did not see the ship that was firing them, but at about the same time the rescue ship Carpathia was racing up from the southeast, firing rockets to let Titanic know that help was on the way. At 4.16, Chief Officer George F. Stewart relieved Stone, and almost immediately noticed, coming into view from the south, a brilliantly lighted, Four-masted steamship with one funnel. This would later prove to be Carpathia. Lord woke up at 4:30 and went out on deck to decide how to proceed past the ice to the west. At 5:30, acting on his own initiative, Stewart woke Evans and asked him to find out why a ship had fired rockets during the night. He turned on the wireless and found out that Titanic had sunk overnight. Stewart took the news to Captain Lords, who ordered the ship underway. However, instead of proceeding south through clear water to Titanic's last reported position, he ordered her to head west and into the ice flow. After passing slowly through it, she reached clear water, increased speed, and finally turned south. She actually passed the Carpathia to the east, then turned, and headed northeast back towards the rescue ship, arriving at 8.30. Lord later explained that this convoluted route was due to ice conditions, even though there was clear water between his original position and Titanic a Euro unregistered trademark S reported position. Carpathia was just finishing picking up the last of Titanic's survivors. After communication between the two ships, Carpathia left the area leaving Californian to search for any other survivors, but it only found scattered wreckage and empty lifeboats. Captain Lord has been accused of being downright unwilling to adjust to a new situation. He had, like any other captain, his own ship and crew to be mindful of, hence his decision to stay stopped for the night owing to the vast amounts of ice in the ocean, which, it is said, was indeed an act of prudence. It is also said, however, that this constituted no reason for a good mariner to do nothing upon learning of the distress rockets. He was presented with a new situation that night, and, had he increased his lookouts, he would have safely made it to the scene or without any serious risks, if anything. According to the British inquiry, if it had acted upon the rockets and pushed through the ice, the Californian might have saved many if not all of the lives that were lost. Captain Lord was also criticized at the American inquiry for his failure to respond to the rockets. Equals aftermath equals, as public knowledge grew of the Titanic disaster, questions soon arose on how the disaster occurred as well as if and how it could have been prevented. An American inquiry started on April 19, the day Californian arrived unnoticed in Boston. Initially, the world was unaware of her and her part in the Titanic disaster. 
On April 22, the inquiry discovered that a ship near Titanic had failed to respond to the distress signals. The identity of the ship was unknown. The next day, a small newspaper in New England, the Daily Item, printed a shocking story claiming that Californian had refused aid to Titanic. The source for the story was her carpenter, James McGregor, who stated that she had been close enough to see Titanic a Euro unregistered trademark S lights and distress rockets. By sheer coincidence, on the same day, the Boston American printed a story sourced by her assistant engineer, Ernest Gill, which essentially told the same story as the daily item. Lord also spoke with Boston area newspapers. In one article on April 19, Lord claimed that his ship was 30 miles from Titanic, but in the Boston Post of the 22nd April he claimed 20 miles. He told the Boston Globe that his ship had spent three hours steaming around the wreck site trying to render assistance, but third officer Grove later stated that the search ended after two hours, at 10.30. When reporters asked Lord about his exact position the night of the disaster, he refused, calling such information state secrets. He also claimed that he did not use the wireless because his ship had been stopped, and thus the wireless was not working. In fact, only her engines were stopped. She was under steam the whole night and the wireless only needed to be turned on. After the newspaper revelations on April 23, the American Inquiry subpoenaed Gill, as well as Captain Lord and others from Californian. During his testimony, Gill repeated his claims. Lord a Euro unregistered trademark S testimony was conflicting and changing. For example, he detailed three totally different ice conditions. He admitted knowing about the rockets but insisted that they were not distress rockets, and were not fired from Titanic but a small steamship, the so-called Euro or a third ship a Euro of the night. Yet the testimony of Captain J. Knapp, U.S. Navy, and a part of the Navy hydrographer Euro unregistered trademark S office, made clear that Titanic and Californian were in sight of each other, and that no third vessel had been in the area. The so-called scrap log of Californian also came under question. This is a log where all daily pertinent information is entered before being approved by the captain and entered into the official log. Yet the scrap log was missing. In an extraordinary omission, the official log never mentioned a nearby ship, or rockets. However, at the British inquiry, in an equally extraordinary omission, the second officer of Californian was never asked to recall the notations he had actually written in it, during his bridge watch between midnight and 4.00 on April 15. On May 2, the British Court of Formal Investigation began. Again, Lord gave conflicting, changing, and evasive testimony. By way of contrast, the captain of Carpathia, at each inquiry, gave consistent and forthright testimony. It is significant that, during the British inquiry, Captain Arthur Rostron of Carpathia was asked to confirm an affidavit he had made to the United States inquiry. Among the other things in his affidavit, he confirmed that it was daylight at about 4.20 a.m. At 5 o'clock it was light enough to see all around the horizon. We then saw two steamships to the northwards, perhaps seven or eight miles distant. Neither of them was Californian. During the inquiry, the crew of Californian also gave conflicting testimonies. Most notably, Captain Lord said he was not told that the nearby ship had disappeared, contradicting testimony from James Gibson who said he reported it and that Lord had acknowledged him. Also during the inquiries, survivors of Titanic recalled seeing the lights of another ship that was spotted after she had hit the iceberg. To her fourth officer Boxall the ship appeared to be off her bow, five miles away and heading in her direction. Just like Californian's officers, Boxall attempted signaling the ship with a Morse lamp, but received no response. Titanic's Captain Edward Smith had felt the ship was close enough that he ordered the first lifeboats launched on the port side to row over to the ship, drop off the passengers, and come back to Titanic for more. The lights of the ship were seen from her lifeboats throughout the night. One rowed towards them, but never seemed to get any closer. Both the American and British inquiries found that Californian must have been closer than the 19 one or two miles claimed by Lord, and that both ships were visible from the other. Indeed, when Carpathia arrived at the wreck site, 
a vessel was clearly seen to the north. This was later identified as Californian. Both inquiries concluded that Captain Lord failed to provide proper assistance to Titanic and the British inquiry further concluded that had Californian responded to Titanic's rockets and gone to assist, that it might have saved many if not all of the lives that were lost. Later, careful study indicated that had Californian properly responded there would have still been a great loss of life but that perhaps 300 additional lives might have been saved. In the months and years following the disaster, numerous preventative safety measures were enacted. The United States passed the Radio Act of 1912, which required 24 a euro hour radio watch on all ships in case of an emergency. The first International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea formed a treaty that also required 24 a euro hour radio monitoring and standardized the use of distress rockets. After the publication of A Night to Remember, Captain Lord sought a rehearing of the inquiry relating to his ship to counter the allegations made in the book. Petitions presented to the UK government in 1965 and 1968 by the Mercantile Marine Service Association, a union to which Captain Lord belonged, failed to get the matter re-examined. As a result of Ballard's expedition showing that Titanic was not in the position determined in the original investigation, the Board of Trade ordered a re-examination. In 1992, the British government's Marine Accident Investigation Branch concluded its reappraisal of evidence relating to the SS Californian. The conclusions of the MAIB report were those of Deputy Chief Inspector, James de Coverley. The MAIB report stated, What is significant, however, is that no ship was seen by the Titanic until well after the collision. Watch was maintained with officers on the bridge and seamen in the Crow were Euro unregistered trademark S Nest, and with their ship in grave danger the lookout for another vessel which could come to their help must have been most anxious and keen. It is in my view inconceivable that the Californian or any other ship was within the visible horizon of the Titanic during that period. It equally follows that the Titanic can't have been within the Californian Euro unregistered trademark S horizon. The report went on. More probably, in my view, the ship seen by Californian was another, unidentified, vessel. The original investigator of the 1992 reappraisal was a Captain Barnett. He had concluded that the Titanic was seen by the Californian and indeed kept under observation from 2300 or soon after on April 14 until she sank, and that he bases this view on the evidence from Captain Lord and the two watch officers. It was after Barnett's original report was submitted that Captain de Coverley was given the task of further examination. Both Barnett and de Coverley had concluded that Titanic's rockets had been seen and that Officer Stone and Captain Lord had not responded appropriately to signals of distress. The 1992 Marine Accident Investigation Branch report concluded that Captain Lord and his crew's actions fell far short of what was needed. Captain Lord's chief defender and union attorney, Leslie Harrison, who had led the fight to have Californian incident re-examined by the British government, called the dual conclusions of the report an admission of failure to achieve the purpose of the reappraisal. Internally, however, the working files of the MAIB reveal that both authors of the report agreed that Titanic and Californian were in sight of each other. The contradictory conclusions can be attributed to the writing of the report being delegated to a junior member of the branch possibly due to the high workload of the MAIB at the time. This could explain some of the inept research, such as references to Samson being the mystery ship seen by Titanic and bizarre conclusions regarding the nature of ocean currents in the vicinity of Titanic wreck site. The findings of the MAIB remain the official position of the British government, as reflected in replies to parliamentary questions in the years since. To this day there are defenders of Captain Lord, yet two conclusions are incontrovertible. First, if he had simply requested that the wireless be turned back on, the mysteries of the night would have been clarified instantly. Second, at both inquiries, he admitted he knew that rockets had been fired. In 1912, it was understood by all seamen that rockets being fired in sequence, no matter their color, were to be interpreted as a distress signal and that aid should be rendered. As author Daniel Allen Butler wrote, a Euro OE the crime of Stanley Lord was not that he may have ignored the Titanic a Euro unregistered trademark S rockets, 
but that he unquestionably ignored Somronio Euro unregistered trademark S cry for help a Euro still, Titanic's out of sequence firing of rockets could have given cause to doubt distress. The manner in which they were fired would officially have meant navigation difficulty, asking to please stand by. Equals World War I equals. Californian continued in normal commercial service until World War I, when the British government took control of her. On November 9, 1915, while en route from Salonica to Marseille, she was torpedoed and sunk approximately 60 miles south-southwest of Cape Matapan, Greece by the German new boat U-35, killing one person. As of 2015, Californian's wreck has not been found and discovered. The Californian went down less than 200 miles from the location where HMHS Britannic, Titanic a Euro a Euro a Euro a sister ship, would be sunk by a mine just over a year later. Notes, citations, references used. Further reading. External links, Californian crew list with biographies, Captain Stanley Lord, SS Californian APV solves a puzzle by Senan Moliny, The Californian Incident. A Reality Check, MAIB Reappraisal of Evidence, The Titanic and the Californian.